If you have your Bibles, you may be turning to the book of Psalms, Psalms 98. Uh, while you're turning there, Bill, I uh, found a thank you card back there with the Johnson's prayer card in it and some money, so we'll put that in the missions box and you can read that if you wish. And, uh, all right, Psalms 98 in the very first verse. Psalms 98, in the very first verse. The Bible says, O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation, his righteousness had he openly shewed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a, long, a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the heart and with the heart. Excuse me. Sing unto the Lord with the heart, with the heart and the voice of a song. With trumpeters, the sound of the cornet. Make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Let the floods cap, clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he cometh to judge the earth, when with righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for your goodness, Lord, for how you have blessed our church. Lord, pray, we pray this morning that you might meet with us, that you come in among us and use your word to minister. God, we pray that you'd convict us of our own sins and where we failed you and what you've done and what we've done. Lord, we pray that you would uh, cause us to be an humble people for you. Lord, that you would uh, use us as vessels. Lord, that you would uh, proclaim your name in this place where you've given us. Lord God, uh, encourage your people today, and this would be our prayer. Amen. Amen. Now, we find here a psalm of victory. Um, the psalmist is not titled, uh, the best we know it is not a psalm of David. Uh, the writer's not given, and uh, so it had to be an individual, we are assuming, outside the royalty that was just a person in Israel that loved the Lord. A person in Israel that saw that if there was any victory to be had, that victory was in the person of the Lord. And we live in a day and age today where what I see that most people live in, they actually live in defeat. And I'm not talking about lost people, I'm talking about redeemed people. They live to the point when you see them, it's look like they're kicked down already. And you know what? Uh, I've seen some of them use the, the last day theory as a reason for that. You know, uh, we may be in the last days, but uh, we may be not quite there yet. Uh, and so, just because you may consider it to be the last day, doesn't mean you have to be unhappy about it. In fact, the flip side would be, hey, if this little ball of wax is about wound up, I'm going to see Christ. Amen. So, so why be discouraged? But the majority of so-called Christians today, that is what you find in them, is that they're quite a discouraged people. There are people that uh, seemingly, although they have the victory, they don't claim the victory, they don't live in the victory, and, and so uh, it's almost like we're a defeated people. But the psalmist here says, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Now, what a glorious thing it is, and so I really like what Brother Junior's been doing, at least one of the songs we've been singing recently is something that we've never done or haven't done in a long, long time, and, and that's a good thing because we should always be looking for a new, ways, a new way to praise our Lord. Uh, we, need, we need to sing His name. We need to glorify Him. And the psalmist here recognized the importance of singing praises unto the Lord. If you'll read the worship service, such as when the Ark of the Covenant uh, was moved into the house of Israel, uh, uh, once the temple was actually built, 
They had an unbelievable praise time. They sang, they clapped their hands, they glorified God, and they brought the temple into the house. Now, that's what this psalmist is thinking of, is, is being in a victorious state, being in a situation spiritually where you can praise the Lord. I'll sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. Now, uh, I want each of you to think about this morning uh, in your mind the marvelous things that Christ has done for you. And if you're redeemed, if you're a saved individual this morning, if you can't do anything else, you praise Him for that. Now, uh, that's not all He's done for you. Uh, breath of life. Mm -hmm. uh, my hips is really hurting today, both of them. But you know what? I was able to get up, go down and feed the cows, fed the chickens, watered Donna's flowers, gave myself a shower, all that with no help from anybody else. That's a reason to praise the Lord. Uh, things could be worse. You know what I'm saying? Things could be more difficult. It may be someday where somebody's having to feed me. Things could be worse. And so this psalmist recognized that living in a victory doesn't mean that you're in a million dollar mansion. It doesn't necessarily mean that you feel good every day that comes along. It just simply meant that he was living in the victory that God gave him. Now, the lost people, I want you to listen to me. You're in the goodness of God's grace even this morning because you got breath of life. You put your fingers to your wrist and you've got pulse going there. And, and you know what? That's a great, wonderful blessing. That's a victory that, listen, out here in the boneyard they don't have. Right. And, and so we see then as the Lord's people, we ought to give Him praise for the victory wherein we live, for the victory that He's already given us. So sing unto the Lord a new song, for He hath done marvelous things. His right hand and His holy arm have gotten him the victory. Now, I want you to notice two things. It says his right hand. Now, uh, you know, we began to think uh, about the person of God sometimes. It's hard to imagine him in, in terms that we can understand. But it says this concerning the law of God that it was written with the finger of God. Uh, that, you know, I don't know if God's right-handed or not. Do you? But I know this, it says that here that the victory came through his right, his right hand, that he had done marvelous things. So when, when he wrote the law of God in very, his very self, that's a victory. You know, a lot of people want to ignore the Old Testament almost in its entirety. But listen, if you do that, this is the thing, you'll never learn what sin is because the law outlines what sin is. It, it, it separates very specifically what we're about and that our nature really is entirely against God and, and, and it shows us who we are and so we don't understand our victory without Him uh, and his, ho uh, his right hand and His holy arm have gotten Him the victory. So we find here that our Lord God of heaven, the great God Jehovah, is victorious over all. No matter what you may be thinking this morning, no matter what the world may have convinced you of, no matter what supposed friends uh, you, they, that you have seen in them, listen, God is given the victory. Uh, you know, I tell people this time and time again, don't watch me because I will let you down. But God has gotten victory. One thing that will never, one, two people, three people, two people will never let you down. God Jehovah, God the Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. They will never, ever let you down. Right. Mankind will, but they won't. And the reason why is because they've gotten the victory. And, and so we live then, uh, and we see then that this is, a, this is a state that the Lord's people are to be in. The Lord had made known His salvation. Now, this is the problem and this is the difficulty in me today. I want you to read that with me again. The Lord had made known His salvation. Now, the salvation 
uh, that you want this morning and the salvation that will be enduring and the salvation that will take you into eternity is his salvation. And notice it didn't say, it didn't say your salvation, it said his salvation. The salvation that comes from God. Not that comes from mankind, not that comes in the, in the pool of baptism, but a salvation that comes from God. See, he brings salvation to you. You don't go hunting for it. And, and, and that's not a real, a real pleasant thing to talk about in 2019, but that's the reality of the Bible. And, and, and this verse is even more credence to that, is that he brings salvation. That's a great and wonderful victory. And as we look at our lives and we look at our... And, and, and we look within our souls, do you really have that? There's nothing that could be any more important that you answer truthfully this morning. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Christ. The Lord had made known His salvation, His righteousness had He openly shewed into the sight of the heathen. Now, in verse 2, it says He showed that character, that holiness of God to the heathen. Now, get this, we're the heathen. We, we are the Gentiles. We are the non-Jews. We are the individuals that were not the apple of God's eye, the great God Jehovah, but rather we are the heathen. He says, I've made known my righteousness to them. You know what? When you really get a hold of the holiness of God, you, you know what the, the real good thing that comes out of that is you'll see how depraved you really are. That, that's the good thing. That, that's when we become and, and begin to understand, hey, uh, I need something more than I have. Uh, uh, I, I'm not complete. I, 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 don't have, I, I don't have a fullness like I should. And so learning your guiltiness and, and learning your, your vileness before God is in fact a very, very important thing. And it says here that the Lord in His victory has done this, has showed it to His people. Verse 3. He had remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. Now, again, I want you to see that Israel is very and very important to the great God Jehovah. He always will be, always has been in eternity. Amen. That will always be the apple of God Jehovah's eye. Yeah. And he says, I showed them too. I've showed him my righteousness. I've showed you think about time and time again the great and wonderful victories that Israel was uh, shown, and still they turned their back on God. Yeah. Walking up to the Red Sea and splitting wide open one side to the other, running across, kicking up sand on the way, and then they got out there and began to grumble and complain about food. Not even one week later one week later. So we see then uh, Lord grants us victories in our life, does He not? When He gives you a great victory over something, you know what? It, it should be a time of rejoicing, but many times we are just like Israel and we experience a wonderful victory and, and two days later, what am I doing here? What's the reason for this? See, uh, Remember the victories that he... And you know what? Your victories may be few and far between. But when you have one, cling hold to it and remember it and, and uh, enjoy it and go back and feast on it time and time again. And so he, he says that he then should be victorious and Israel should be victorious with this result in uh, verse 4. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Now, you know, uh, those that are in victory this morning, if you really believe that you have a victory, that the Lord has saved your soul, and that, that, that you uh, are near unto the Lord this morning, sing a song, give Him praise, lift His name up. A song of victory. Listen, it doesn't have to be good. You may sing like me or worse, but a song of victory. And you know, um, I think it's in uh, 1 Peter. He says, sing with your heart. It doesn't have to be audible. It, you know, if you're doing it for everybody else to hear, then you're doing it for the wrong reason anyway, right? 
And, and, and so we see then that as the psalmist is writing here, he says, if you possess this victory, let it be shown. Let, let people know it. And you know what? Uh, some people may be just fine. And I, I walk around the nursing home sometime and, and looking at people and wondering their thoughts and kind of wondering about what their life situation has been. And, and they look happy. We had a, we had a veteran there. About two years ago, he's passed now. One of the happiest men, appearingly happy men, that you could ever imagine. Just, just a really good guy. And he'd been at the Battle of the Bulge. And one of the most miserable times, literally guy's feet frozen off. And uh, happy. You, you know, I, you know, we need to understand your circumstance really, in a spiritual sense, has nothing to do with your happiness. If we're really depending on the Lord Jesus Christ, every day should be a victory. Every day should be a time to give glory and praise. And, and, and these little circumstances around us that seem to catch our vision and, and pull us away from the things of the Lord... They really don't matter anyway. So make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Now, I want you to see that word in verse 4 there, rejoice. Now, uh, to rejoice, you've had to experience joy at one time or another. Uh, when, uh, when you, the uh, only game I really liked, and I was actually half decent in that ball game, was um, uh, not beach ball, but uh, had the net between you. So, thank you. And uh, I was actually pretty decent at it in grade school. And when you served the ball, you did it like this, and then somebody would knock it back to you and back and forth. Well, if I never served the ball, they could never return it to me. And if you've never had joy, you certainly can't return it back to God. Yeah. Right? And a lot of people don't, you know why a lot of people don't have joy? Is they've never experienced it. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith. You know what those are? Those are the fruits of the Spirit. And the only thing I can come to, if you, if you remain in misery all the time, and you know, you know you always look like a cow eating briars, you know what? The only thing I can come to is you're lost. Because you have no joy. And we live in the day and age today where seemingly, you know what, uh, our type of church is particularly like walking around on the eggshells, afraid somebody will think you're a little bit too happy or something. You know what? We are to be a joyful people. You know what? When I die, if I die here or whatever, if I die, I'm going home to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to see the mighty God of all heaven, the great God Jehovah. I'm going to lay at his feet and, and, and put this ungodly flesh down and all the worries and the, and the mess that goes with it. What a, why wouldn't I rejoice? And you know why I can? It's because the Lord has convinced me of those truths. He's given me that joy. And so I'm going to rejoice back. I'm going to serve it back to him. And, and so those of us that are redeemed, uh, we find the psalmist here gives them very good sound advice. If you understand this victory, then rejoice in it. Verse 5, sing unto the Lord with a heart, with, with the heart and the voice of a song. Yeah, I think it's uh, very unusual that the psalmist here repeats the heart twice. And uh, I, I've never seen a harpist live. I think Donna has. Donna has a, a friend that her daughter is a harpist. I guess that's what you call it. And, uh, you know, they strum it. And, you know, it, it, one little bit I've seen on TV, it's a very unique, beautiful instrument. It really is. And um, he says, you, sing, you know, sing with the music. You know, uh, there there's nothing wrong with music in church buildings. Uh, primitive Baptist people don't believe that. Uh, I don't see that. You know, I will say this. This is the only thing I'll say about that because I fully believe any kind of music is good as long as it don't sound worldly. Uh, you know, I, will, I don't understand how people come to the point that it can only be a piano. Uh, I, I don't 
because Panda didn't exist then, right? And but uh, we we need we need to praise him with what we have. Uh, That's right. The apparently the song stuff the music is important, right? To mention it twice back to back, the song is thought for some reason this is an important element that I want to get to them again. So those of you that do have that gift, and we have several that do, my advice would be that you use it so you won't lose it. And, and, and uh, because here we find that that's a way to praise the Lord. That's a way to rejoice. That's a way to give it back to Him. And so then we as the Lord's people, we ought to do that with everything we have. Verse 6, with trumpets and the sound of cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord and uh, before the Lord, the King. Now, I want you to notice two things. Uh, these two instruments are very similar, but they're horns, often used to call people to duty, often used to, to bring the troops to attention, but, uh, and even to give signal to what the next battle plan is. But I want you to see that he says, use these instruments to the joy of the Lord. So you think about this morning what you have. Now you may be like me with no musical ability at all, but you know what? I've got some instruments. I've got some nursing knowledge that I hope I'll keep with me to the, until I'm in the grave somewhere. And you know what? I'm going to use it for the Lord. Uh, if, I, if one of you, if I find a brother and sister, uh, that needs something, a dressing change, or something I do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to blow my trumpet, and I'm going to blow it loud. I can preach a little bit. And God be my helper, I will preach till my days are done. And I'm going to blow the trumpet and just as loud as I can blow it. It may be on the street corner. I'm fine with that. I've done that. I'll do it again, the Lord be my helper. It may be in this church building. It may be in another church building. But you know what? Keep doing it. Whatever, whatever your gift is, you use it for the glory of God. And keep blowing the trumpet. And so we find the psalmist here uh, says if you're in that victory this morning, whatever little bit you may have, use it for the glory. Use it to the honor of the uh, uh, Lord. Verse 7, we see two things. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Now, if you've never seen the ocean, you need to. It's a glorious and wonderful thing. Stand on the, on the, uh, and you don't have to run naked to go to the ocean. Let me, let me say that. I, I, I've been dressed just like I am, let the waves just come right on in on me. Uh, beautiful, glorious thing. To look out and think, you know what? God put all that into place. See the tide roll in and the tide roll out. Uh, he, she said, he said, let the sea roar. Let, let it show the majesty of God. You know, one thing I found equally amazing, and, and if you don't want to go to the seashore, go, go up north. The, 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 lakes, uh, the lakes in Michigan are beautiful. I mean, until you've seen one, you just, it's literally like a freshwater sea. It's gorgeous. And, uh, and, and you know what? They're saying, I'm here. It's just like me clapping my hands, saying, this is the God of the Bible. I created all this. All things are under my feet. Uh, everything is, it is within my scope. Everything I've got done to glorify myself, that is what this is about. So he says, let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, meaning us, let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together. Now, flooding is a very, very dangerous thing. And where we live, particularly 30, 40, I guess now more like 70 years ago, before the dam system came, uh, one flood a family could be gone in 15 minutes, entire family. Uh, uh, how could that be glorified? I guarantee if you survived that you'd be glorifying him. Uh, knew an old lady uh, several years ago. Uh, I, was, I was a kid, uh, 18. She was uh, approaching 100 then. And she, uh, she lived in what's land between the lakes now. And uh, 
she described she, the house that her and her husband lived in, and a flood came, and of course the house was underwater, and when it left, she, uh, she, she described scraping mud off the ceilings. That's how high the water had gotten. And she said, you know, but Larry, God was good. We didn't drown. <laughs> Amen. And so she was all right with, sc with scraping mud off her ceiling because God had been good. See, when we always want to look on the negative. You know, as long as you look on the negative, you'll never, ever, ever live in victory. Right. You'll always be like, woo, woe is me. Yeah. Woe is you. What do you got to woe about? You're still above the sod. <laughs> God's still on the throne. He saved your never dying soul. What do you what do you got to complain about? And, 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 and so we see then as Lord's people that irregardless then of circumstance, if you belong unto the Lord, even when you're put through a trial and you come out on the other side, there's something to praise the Lord for. Verse 9, before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. Now, as the psalmist is closing out here, he says, you remember this. In this joy, in this victory, the ultimate victor is he's judging this earth. Well, you know what? When the Sodomites think that they've got this world by the tail and all that they say goes, when the Democratic Party thinks that they're going to bring in socialism, listen, don't you sweat it one bit, don't lose one night of sleep over it, because you know what? If it happens, it happens, and it's part of God's plan, because nothing happens out of his will. If it happens, you just remember this. <laughs> There's a greater judge coming. He will put everything right under his feet. You know, two, two, two things about judgment. Either you'll look forward to it or you'll dread it. Right? Uh, I like looking at uh, murder mysteries. And, you know, I like at the end and it, it, they're standing there before the judge. And you know what I've found? <laughs> they don't like the judgment. Guilty. Guilty. And uh, uh, you know what? <laughs> if you've not been saved, if you've not been born again, you're not going to like the judgment either. It's not going to be part of what you enjoy. So uh, this morning then, are you living in victory or are you living in defeat? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you not know Him in, in the free pardon of sin? Well, what is your situation? Now go with me to the book of Acts chapter 16. Acts 16. Uh, the Acts is a wonderful book. It's largely ignored by Baptists because uh, some of the stuff in there uh, we don't necessarily like to touch on. Uh, but it's one wonderful book that shows the victory that our God uh, accomplishes in men's lives. Acts chapter 16, verse 19. Acts 16 and verse 19. Uh, uh, the Bible says, And when her master saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they called Paul and Silas. Now, if you know your Bible, you're familiar with this instance. Uh, uh, there had been a prophetess, there had been a, a, a damsel that supposedly could tell the future that would every time that Paul and Silas uh, would walk by, she would say, these be the men of the Most High God. And so finally Paul got sick of it one day and says, come out from among her. And the devil had to leave. And man, that began to turn up some, tr turn up some trouble. You know what that was when that demon had to come out of that young woman? It was a victory. You know what? She, she didn't have a demon in her anymore. What, what, you know, that's a victory. But did people rejoice over it? Only two. In fact, if I understand this correctly, she didn't even rejoice in it. So I'll have to say this, just because the demon was gone didn't make her saved. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and so we find then that, that this had just happened and instead of causing people to rejoice and be glad in the things of God, it actually made people a little bit upset. And so they captured Paul and Silas and, 
drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers, verse 20, and brought, the, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our cities, uh, our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. Now, I want you to see the next piece they bring in is, hey, this is against what, the, what Rome teaches. It's not a God of Rome, and so we don't like it. We want you under uh, governmental judgment. You know what? If we live long enough, church, we're going to be under governmental judgment. That little tax ID number, listen, it's not just out there for us to look at and for me to put on my tax return uh, in the fall. They're watching us. They know exactly what we're doing. They know exactly what we teach. They know exactly what we preach. And listen, when the right people come in, that's going to be illegal. Right? So this instance can happen today. It's easy for what we teach and preach to be, uh, to be considered offensive to the right people. And, and, and so that's all that was really happening. The government was against what Paul and Silas were teaching. Verse 22, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison charging the jailer to keep, them sa to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust him into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. Now, are you ready to rejoice? Now, you think about every event that happened. Demon cast out. People of the world come against them, which has always happened when God's people are victorious. And... Then they're cast into prison, got their feet locked in stocks. You gonna rejoice? You 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 gonna are you gonna be glad about that? You gonna be glorifying God in, in the very fact that you're locked up? Now, I've never been locked up, don't know nothing about it, uh, never had the door shut behind me, and, and I thank God that I haven't. But I really have to say this, if that happened, I don't think I would rejoice. I'm just being honest with you. But notice what, notice what happens. Verse 25, and at midnight. See, sometimes it takes a little bit of contemplation. Sometimes it takes a little bit of thought before you can rejoice. Because the best I understand, they probably throwed in about noon or mid-afternoon, and, and they've been down there locked up with their feet and stock for probably by this, this point about 15 hours. 12 hours. And then, you know, you, you have to get out to wonder what they must have talked about. You know what? Uh, I bet at first they kind of had the humming drummies. But somewhere along the way, they begin to remember, look what God's done for us. Listen, when I die, I don't have to go to hell. Man. Somewhere along the way, Paul must have begun to think, began to think and remember, man, at one time I persecuted the church, and I'm just getting back what I give. Yeah, and then, <laughs> somewhere along the way, they got happy. They began to sing, <laughs> you know, God's grace is sufficient. And before you know it, they were, having, they were having a time locked up in stocks and just as happy as they could be. And the reason they could do that, they were joyful. At one time, they were joyful. At one time, they were so glad in the things of the Lord that it just began to flow back. They were rejoicing. In, in what most would see as desperate circumstances, they, were, they rejoiced. And you know the rest of the story. God blessed that. And listen, you know what? I fully believe this. If they hadn't began praising God and singing and praising, you know what? That, the rest of those prisoners would never even heard the gospel. They would never heard what was going on because they'd been in there, woo-hoo. They, they'd be, well, them men just crying like we are. 
They're, they're just as upset as we are that they're. One mother saw no difference between them and Paul and Silas, but because Paul and Silas began to rejoice, listen, they began to see a difference. Every one of those prisoners led to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then on top of that, we find the Philippian jailer that the Lord saved and all his family. And then finally, years later, we see the letter to the uh, church at Philippi. Out of those one events, one of the Lord's churches was started. See, are you rejoicing? Have you ever experienced joy? Have you ever experienced victory in your life? The reason that they could do this is at one time in their life, God had given them great victory over sin. Now go with me to the book of Acts again, this time chapter 5, just a little bit further back. Acts 5 and verse 40. Acts 5 and verse 40. The Bible says, And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and had beaten them. Now, again, what seems like a tragedy, just a, a few days out from Pentecost, um, they're, they're preaching the word of God, and they get thrown into jail again. Uh, this is the church of Jerusalem this time. And it would be a, it, this would be one of those things that was optional to quit. I'm sick of this stuff. Uh, I, I'm, I'm done here. I don't like being in jail. I, I, I'm done with this stuff. And, and you know what? I have to say, probably I would have been one of those quitters except that one time I received the joy. Now, I'm not bragging on myself, but I really believe those of us who are genuinely saved, when we face this stuff, and we may one day, the true blues in that mess will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Not on our own merit, not on our own strength, but on the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he'll give us strength in the day that is sufficient. That's what he's promised us. Right? And, and so uh, I believe we'll be able to say, blessed be the name of the Lord when the stripes begin to fly, when the whip begins to hit. Listen, I think if we have experienced re joy, if we've experienced joy, we'll be able to throw a little back his way. And so we find there, just a little earlier in the church time, here the church of Jerusalem uh, has a little bit of problem. And I must say this, that a... Huh. A non-believer, a lost man said, listen, if this is not of God, this was just before, this was an advice given by someone who was not saved. He said, listen, if this is not of God, it's going to run out. And so when they heard that, huh, the magistrates decided just to beat them. Verse 40, and to him they agree, meaning this man that said, hey, uh, you're overthinking this. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they, meaning the apostles, departed from the presence of counsel, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Good. So if you got the beating and you can't take it, if you got the beating... And after it was done, you quit. The only thing that I could come to is you never had the victory to start with. I do not believe God's people are quitters. I really don't. Because he's given them something that will last for eternity. So why would we possibly believe that it won't last here? Right? So if people don't stick to the stuff, what about them? Are they living in victory? What about you this morning? You're here with us, and, and what a blessing it is, but are you living in victory? Or is every day another struggle? Is every day another problem? Or do you get up and say, whoo, two things. I can be used of you today, Lord, or maybe I should look to the eastern sky, and maybe this is the day that you're coming to get me. One of the two. But how do you get up? 
Oh, man. Here we go. Listen, I'm not going down east on 79 rejoicing that I have to show up at the nursing home. But I will say this, I do have a job. Right? Mm -hmm. But I do rejoice. I, I like, you know, that's one thing about look, working east of here. You're going into the sun, going to work, and you're going in, you're looking at it, you're blinded both ways. Uh, yeah. But I look into that sun and think, you know what? This might be it. This could be the day. And uh, what a rejoicing that is. And, and you know, do you get up with that attitude? See, the devil don't want you to live in that type of victory. He really doesn't. He wants you to live in such a state that you, you're frozen in fear and you're miserable. You're so miserable, you can't even say amen. You're so miserable, you can't even lift holy hands. So miserable that you dread the next day coming. What kind of life is that? Do you think that's what he's called you to live? Do you think that's how he, what he wants for his own people? Certainly not. Are you living in victory, brother?